Thank you for tuning in to Goddess Love Ministry 7 and for joining me in this Bible study um, in which I would like to find some answers in the Bible to the following questions. Number one, in Revelation, what did Jesus Christ mean when he called the church of Laodicea wretched, poor, blind, and naked? Number two, what did he mean when he said that he would come like a thief to those who are sleeping? Number three, who was Jesus Christ talking to specifically? Number four, what does thief in the night mean? And five, what does it mean and how will the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, be revealed? So we will find all of those answers right in the Word of God. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. And we'll begin reading the letter to the church in Laodicea. It says in verse 14, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So there it is right there. What does he mean by that? Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. So what does this mean? This is obviously in a spiritual sense. So what does it mean to spiritually be wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked? And... Let's read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And in verse 4, it says, The God of this age, who is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So, and right in verse 3, right before that, it says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So, they cannot, those who cannot see the truth are those who have been blinded by Satan, those who choose not to see. They are willingly ignorant. So that is what we can gain from what Jesus Christ meant by blind. So they do not see the truth. Just like the Bible verse that says, my children hear my voice. My children know my voice. Well, if you're not a child of God, you don't understand and you don't see the truth. And that is by choice. Matthew chapter 13. Verses 15 and 16. People's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears. And they have closed their eyes. So figuratively, they are blind and deaf. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and in turn, I would heal them. So all of these go together, hearing with our ears, seeing with our eyes, and understanding with our heart. This is putting Jesus Christ in our heart and our faith comes from the heart. So we have an answer to what this, what Jesus Christ meant. These people who are wretched, poor, blind, and naked are spiritually this way, and that is because they lack faith. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 3 and read what he wrote 
to in the letter to the church in Sardis, it says in verses 3 through 5 in chapter 3, Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who not, have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. And in verse 6 it says, He who, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And it, actually in each message to the church, it says this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. So he who is not spiritually blind, spiritually deaf, will receive the word of God in their heart. Now let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And read about those who are sleeping versus those who are awake and... There's also the mention of the thief. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now, brothers, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day would surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. So, sinning goes on a lot of times at night time. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, so this is tied in with the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, it will come upon those who are sleeping, who are without faith, like a thief in the night, because they are of the night and they are sleeping spiritually. But God did not appoint us, who are of the day, to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, now this is talking about actual physical life versus death. So just as what was previously written at the end of chapter 4 before getting into this about um, the day of the Lord in chapter 5, if we just kind of ignore the, the chapter and verse, this is actually all within the same context. When it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. There's encouragement in this. There. This is a positive message for those who have faith in Jesus God Christ. God did not appoint us to, to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. So that salvation is when he himself comes for us and we will meet him in the clouds. And so what this means here in chapter 5, verse 10, for whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. That means for those who are dead and alive in Christ, because the Bible actually actually refers to death as sleeping because it's just a temporary state of not being conscious when we are dead. So for those who are dead and alive in Christ, we will be gathered together with him at the time that he comes back for us, which will begin the day of the Lord. We'll be snatched out and the day of the Lord will begin. Now let's continue on reading some, some more scriptures to answer these questions. In Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14, 
tell us more about what it means to be of the day and to be clothed. Let no debt remain outstanding, verse 8, except the continuing debt to love one another, for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do, do not murder, do not steal, and whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's why love is the greatest commandment, because it actually unites all these other commandments. Love does no, no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And isn't that so true? The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So let us put aside the um, deeds of the night. You know, those who are of the night love their sin. They reject truth. And those who are of the day love God. We should behave decently. Let us, have, let us behave decently as in the daytime in chapter 13. Not in orgies and drunkenness, and not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Now, we, we all fall into sin, and, and what we are instructed here is to not think about how to gratify this sinful desires, not to behave indecently as those who are of the night. So we are to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith in Jesus Christ clothes us with him. So we are not naked if we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We are not wretched, poor, blind, naked as Jesus Christ um, was condemning the church of Laodicea for. Another thing that I'd like to mention is that who who was Jesus Christ really speaking to when he when he condemned the church of Laodicea because from what we can read in scriptures the true church is free from accusation so what we can conclude from that from the other scriptures, comparing scripture to scripture, everything must fit together and be in harmony. So what Jesus Christ was doing is he was addressing the church groups. We know that in every church, there are unsaved people. I don't care if they, they put in the effort to go every Sunday. If they don't have true faith, they're not going to be saved through their works. Because that's not what the true gospel is. We are not saved through our works. We are saved through faith. So I always like to go to Colossians because this just really, really makes it all clear. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, it says, The body of Christ is the church. So those of us who are in the body of Christ are those of us who have faith. And in Col Colossians chapter 1, Verse 21 and 22, it says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So those of us who put our faith on Jesus Christ, we're free from accusation. So that makes it more clear why Jesus Christ was condemning the church of Laodicea because they didn't have true faith as we have already read the answers as to what it meant when he, when Jesus Christ said that they were wretched, poor, blind, and naked. So let us not be that. Let us be clothed, awaken of the day, and Jesus Christ will not come to us like a thief. He comes, as we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, that Jesus Christ comes to those who are of the night as a thief. But we are of the day, so that he will not come to us like a thief. And let's read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, it says, Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, 
not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. So when Jesus Christ comes back for, for us, we will be, our mortal bodies will be swallowed up by immortality and we will have eternal life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So we have Holy Spirit as a deposit. And when Jesus Christ returns, those of us who have Holy Spirit are going up to meet him in the clouds. So for now, as we read, we are clothed with Jesus Christ. So we will not be found naked. And then here, when Jesus Christ returns for us, we will be caught up to meet him in the air in the twinkling of an eye, and we will be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. And let's just go back. For me, it's just a page. Go back a page. Um, and in second, I mean, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 51, it says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. So here's that word sleep, meaning physical death. So that has nothing to do with those who are sleeping, who lack faith. Verse 52, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be clothed with our heavenly dwelling when Jesus Christ returns for us. <laughs> and it flashed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed for the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality then the saying that is written will come true death has been swallowed up in victory verse 55 where O death is your victory where O death is your sting not in those who belong to Jesus Christ, because coming back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 4, it says, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. When, we, when he returns for us, we will be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, and we will not be perishable or mortal anymore. And now let's look into what it means that the day of the Lord will come like a thief and that Jesus Christ will come like a thief. And we will begin to answer that question in Matthew. Chapter 24. In verse... 36 through 44, it says, No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had not, I mean, had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. So <clears throat> all of this together, if we actually open your mind to receive God's word and to think about the context, many very intelligent people who know a lot of truth about God's word misinterpret this, what I just read, to mean that one taken, the other left means taken in judgment because in verse 39, it says that the sinners knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And why did the flood take them away? They knew nothing about what would happen because they were sleeping. They were of the night. They loved their sin. 
They rejected God. And Noah had faith, so he and his family entered the ark. He was considered a righteous man, and God allowed him to save his family as well and to replenish the earth after all the sinful people were wiped out. But we must rightly divide the word. It says, this is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And then it says, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. And then it says, so on what day the Lord will come? When the Lord comes, he's coming for his people, right? So if you read farther down in verse 43, it says, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, well, in the previous verse we just read, we do not know what day our Lord will come. And then if you back up, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man, but only the Father. Because it says here, if the owner of the house had known at what time the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. Because when Jesus Christ comes, one will be taken and the other left. And who is left behind? The unrighteous God rejectors who reject the truth, who are sleeping. And we can also find this in Luke chapter 17, which brings it all together in clarity about what Jesus meant when he was talking about this, about one being taken, the other left, and the thief coming. In Luke chapter 17, verses 26 through 36, it says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. And it says, the day that Noah entered the ark, the flood came and destroyed the sinners. Then continuing on, reading down farther, as it was the same in the days of Lot, that day that Lot left Sodom, in verse 29, fire and sulfur came down from heaven and destroyed the sinners. It will, in verse 30, it will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. So what is this pattern here? It's a pattern of God getting the righteous out of the way so that he can bring judgment upon the unrighteous. And verse 31, on that day, no one who is, um, sorry, in verse 34, I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken, the other left. So if God removes the righteous to bring judgment on the unrighteous, then that is what this context is with one taken, the other left. Jesus Christ comes like a thief to take his people out of the way and then will bring judgment upon the world. Jesus Christ comes like a thief in the night. Does he snatch the unbelievers and, and, and let the tribulation period, everything that's prophesied in Revelation, come upon the true believers? No. And then we can further strengthen this strengthen our understanding by just looking at first Thessalonians chapter 4 again in verse 17 we will be caught up that the Greek word caught up is harpazo which means to snatch and what does a thief do he snatches and what we read in first Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 and 52 in the twinkling of an eye we will be snatched up so it all fits together Jesus Christ comes like a thief for us. He snatches us out. He snatches us away from the world. So he comes like a thief to those who are of the night, who are spiritually blind, who are wretched, poor, blind, naked, pitiful. And he snatches us away from them. And then what happens? He comes like a thief to those who are sleeping, he said. To those, those who reject the truth. And then the seals are opened after we're taken out of the way. The first seal in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, the rider on the white horse, this is the Antichrist, because this lines up with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, about the day of the Lord beginning when the son of perdition or the man of lawlessness is revealed. He is loosed upon the world, 
he, he, and then in Daniel chapter nine, verse 27, he confirms a covenant for, with many for one week of years uh, for a seven year period. And then halfway through that seven year period, he breaks that covenant. And then he sets himself up to be worshiped as God, which fits right in line with Revelation chapter 13 and 14. He has the world worship him, all whose names are not written in the book of life, and receive his mark, and they must worship his image, and if they don't, they'll be killed. But then if they receive his mark and worship his image, then they are eternally condemned for that, and they will not receive eternal life with God in heaven and with the rest of us. So everything all lines up and works in perfect harmony when you're rightly dividing the word of God. So when Jesus Christ comes like a thief to remove his church, we're snatched out of the world worldwide. How do you think the world is going to react to this? Chaos, fear, peace taken from the earth. Revelation chapter 3 and 4, that's the second seal. Peace taken from the earth, men slaying each other. Then that affects the economy too, which is Revelation chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. That's the third seal. And then in verses 7 and 8, a fourth of the earth is killed by sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. So the thief has taken the light out of the world, and the peace went with it. We are the light and the salt of the earth. And lastly, what does it mean, this ties in with the thief in the night, Jesus Christ being the thief of the night, when, to answer the question, what does it mean when the Son of Man is revealed? It means just that. When Jesus Christ comes like a thief and snatches his church out of the way, it is revealed who Jesus Christ is and that he is true. Because if, if those weirdo Christians who loved Jesus Christ are all gone worldwide, they were taken out of the way and then all these terrible things come upon the world. And then the one true God is revealed. And this all happens to turn the hearts to God who would not have otherwise accepted or seen the truth. So God deals with his children accordingly. He does not discipline the child or the children that don't need discipline. Because Colossians tells us that we are a church without blemish and free from accusation. So we are taken out of the way. And then the children who, who still need to repent, those God will have to deal with in a different manner. Just like in Romans chapter 11. We have been grafted in to the olive tree as the unnatural branches because of our faith. In Jesus Christ so we have been grafted into that olive tree and the unnatural I mean the natural branches who are Israel the natural seed of Abraham there are many who will turn back to the truth so currently they've been broken off because of unbelief read the whole chapter in Romans chapter 11 they've been broken off because of unbelief but God is able to graft them back in again if they do not continue in their unbelief it says here in Romans chapter 11, verse 20, it said, Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Verse 21, For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. So therefore he will spare the natural branches. Verse 22, Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, the sternness to those who fell, but the kindness to you provided that you continue in his kindness. Provided that you continue in your faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 23. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in again, for God is able to graft them in again. 
Verse 25, And I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has, con has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. So they have experienced a hardening in part. This means temporarily they have experienced a hardening. They will not accept Jesus Christ as Messiah. But when we are taken out of the way, Jesus Christ will be revealed as the true Messiah. Because those who are in Jesus Christ, who had true faith, will be taken out of the way. And then all these judgments will come upon the world. And they'll wake up from their slumber. And they'll see, oh, Jesus Christ was the true Messiah. And then those who are gods will believe, finally. But they will have to be dealt with sternly by God. Consider the kindness and the sternness of God. We receive mercy. We will be rescued from the wrath to come. And they will go through the wrath to come because of their unbelief. But God is able to graft them in again. And there will be a multitude from every tribe, nation, and tongue who will also benefit from this. 144,000 people from the 12 tribes of Israel, when they come to the faith, they're going to be evangelizing the world. And then, after that seven-year period is done, Jesus Christ will return with us. And righteousness forevermore. No more killing. No more sickness. No more crying and tears and heartache because of all the sin that's just prospering in the world. God's only going to let it prosper for a temporary period of time. The devil knows his time is running short. And then peace and justice will rule over the earth. Praise God. Hallelujah. I hope this Bible study blessed you, because it sure did bless me. So, keep on studying God's Word, and love God's Word, and cherish it in your heart.